I'd like to set the scene here by reading a quote from your co-editor, Peter Catapano's introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, Catapano describes Question Everything as a continuation of work that you were doing in previous volumes, The Stone Reader, um, here we have Modern Ethics in 77 Arguments, which is to say this work is philosophical commentary written in an engaging and accessible style, free of academic jargon on almost every imaginable topic, from happiness to power to hope. So what's new then, Catapano asks in his introduction. It's organization, organized not by traditional categories like ethics, political philosophy, or epistemology, but thematically by question 13 of them to be exact, the first 12 like the hours of a clock, taking us through the tumultuous time in which these pieces were written, which is to say from late 2015 to 2021, and the last speculating its way into an uncertain future. Simon, as we get started here, can you tell us about this new arrangement of the book and how the tumultuous time, as Catapano remarks, um, possibly contributed to the final arrangement of this book? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I've got them here, actually, I can show you. this is the new one. So this is Question Everything, um, which should look a little bit like the first one, which is that one, The Stone Reader. Um, that was published in 2015, and there's another one called Modern Ethics and 77 Arguments, which was the publisher's idea, not really my idea. This is the first, and this was organised in, um, we ended up publishing, I mean, very happy to publish with, with Livright and uh, Norton, and uh, it was originally, it was originally conceived as four, uh, four paperbacks. Um, with uh, which we're going to be on on philosophy, science, uh, religion, and ethics, and then um, let's say society. So four books, and then we worked with, and that's how the the book was kind of crafted. The first book, this book, this one was crafted like that, and um, and then they wanted to do it as it was one big book, and that came out uh, in 2015, and um, we didn't expect anything. I don't expect much from publishers. I've, done, I've worked too long with them, and um, it's. Uh, but it did. It did well. Uh, we got a lot of. Um, we, you know, it, it, it did. It did well with the help of some ads in the New York Times, and then um, we've been talking for a while about what we do with the the more recent material, uh, which is 2015 to 2021. And we began to organize it around questions rather than around themes. And so the questions we have in the circles are things like, what does it mean to be human? Uh, is democracy possible? You, know, you, you can answer some of these questions for yourself. <laughs> can we believe our eyes? Should speech be free? Big section on freedom of speech. Um, with, uh, you know, there's, there's a very good essay by a, a Canadian based in Paris called Justin E.H. Smith. Yeah a series on uh, happiness, does life have a meaning? Figure that one out. Uh, why can't we all just get along? Uh, difference between right and wrong, what's it like to be a woman? There's a series of pieces there. Uh, something we tried to do over the years was kind of, you know, increase gender representation in philosophy. A series of pieces on art, why does art matter? And this might, this is the only, the only philosophy book that includes an essay by Kate Blanchett. So that's, there we are. So, and, and, and Sonny Rollins and Ai Weiwei. Yes, yes, this is great. So we're gonna, we're gonna get on to the, to the non, more, less traditional philosophers who philosophize in the book. Um, right. And then, then it goes on to, uh, you know, then what next? And there are whole series sure. of um, sure. So it's, it's organized by, by questions. And, uh, and the idea of question everything was really something that came out of, the book is dedicated to two, Two Garys. One Gary is uh, Gary Gutting, who was a very good philosopher at um, Notre Dame and who died a, a few years ago, very sadly. He was a very frequent contributor to this stone and a good friend of mine. And then a guy called Gary, Gary Leib, who was an animator, who did an animation for that first book. And in that animation, he used the words question everything. And that's where we got the idea. He died um, in the pandemic, sadly. And so we, um, we uh, so in, in kind of homage to so the second Gary, we, we called the book that, and we very helpfully, we had a very good editor at Live Right, a woman called Hayley Bracken, I just want to mention her, Hayley Bracken. She basically 
pulled everything together. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so it just came out a few weeks ago. And we'll see what happens. It's well, it's fantastic. It's a totally fantastic. And um, but I I I want to I want to kind of get back to you. I mean, you just mentioned the pandemic. Of course, that's one of the tumultuous things that happens when these times. There's of course also the presidency of Donald Trump. You live in New York. Yeah. You were not um, not affected by that. Did how did the again how did those times maybe make the tenor of this book possibly more intense? I mean, some of the people and you yourself, the essays in this book are written in in lockdown, in yeah. kind of confinement, as we would say in France. And I was as I was rereading them this weekend and even today, it was bringing me back to that that intensity. Um, mm. So, can you just talk about the yeah, relationship sure. of, I mean, of the, the times? Yeah. So we, I mean, you know, the um, uh, there's there's a long tradition of um, philosophy in confinement, uh, all the way back to Socrates in in prison in the in fifth century Athens and Boethius in his prison cell, and so in a sense, if anybody's used to lockdown and confinement, it's it's philosophers. So in a sense, although it was you know we can all complain, it was actually great for us because we had an audience at home who wanted, uh, wanted us to, wanted, wanted to, to read things, uh, had an unusual amount of time. It's the piece that I ended up writing in the, in the pandemic, it's called To Philosophize is to Learn How to Die, which kind of is, is, is sitting there in the book. So the pandemic, in a sense, in a sense, philosophy is, the relationship between philosophy and and plague is pretty interesting. You know, it's uh, I mean, plague is a constant feature of human society, and so is philosophy. So the two things have have coincided before, and the but uh, but Trump, yeah, something else. And the, the, so the odd effect of the odd effect of Trump was. Um, this might sound odd, was that we, there tended to be a kind of narrowing of uh, focus. So what would happen with the stone is that I, I would get pieces during the week and then Peter, my editor, who's a really good friend of mine, would get pieces to we talk about them. And we tried to, you know, represent a range of opinion as far as possible. And um, that became harder to sustain in uh, the Trump years, and we ended up people tended to say the same types of things again and again, which got a bit boring, frankly. So we did, uh, and this was also when the the Times really went, you know, fully, completely, utterly digital. It, it, could just say a word about the history of the cog, because this is interesting. The um, I think it's I think it's interesting. I mean, we began this in 2010, but it goes back to, to work that I was doing with the editor already in 2000, 2008, 2009. And in those distant, distant days, it's almost hard to remember, there was a, there was a print newspaper <laughs> called the New York Times, and that was what mattered, the print newspaper. And then they had you know, a website, and uh, everybody needed a website. But the website was sort of... Um, irrelevant and uh, it would just be for things that weren't serious enough to go into the newspaper. So we use that website to develop, to take all sorts of risks and, um, and develop uh, a community of readers, which we did over the years. And then, and then as things changed from print to digital in you know, 2010, 12, 15, 18, through to 2020, when it's, you know, we're in a full digital moment, uh, we uh, we benefited from that. We were we were really used to reacting to situations uh, quickly, uh, but also we got squeezed out because there was less and less digital New York Times space than we used to used to have. And so, um, yeah. But Trump had a kind of uh, you know, it, 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 what was I guess what was slightly saddening about that was that you tended to get 15, 20 submissions saying the same kind of thing. Yeah, this is awful. <laughs> and it was, um, you know, we were, it wasn't, actually, yeah, Trump was, it wasn't, wasn't really a gift to the, so we, we tended to avoid it, uh, in, particularly in the, the last, the last years of Trump presidency, because it was, uh, it was kind of too obvious what was going to be said. 
This is really an interesting point about the digitalization of the New York Times. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it in the sense that have you noticed, so apart from, I mean, if we kind of put, if we can put aside the Trump era, as you say, as a narrowing of discourse, I mean, in part, I think it's that narrowing is a related to a, a kind of conversation that's happening on Twitter in which the same opinions are passed around and uh, repurposed um, incessantly. <laughs> Um, but did you notice, I guess, over this long decade of rapid digitalization? I mean, I was struck, I think I was kind of looking also in conjunction with this today on the, on the website again, um, that the New York Times has become, there's a school of the New York Times that you can attend. Yeah, we did <laughs> it's become, become a mini empire. I mean, you can essentially, you could, you could do fr from your, from infancy until you die. <laughs> You could live on the New York Times website and receive your political, cultural news. You could receive your recipes. You can receive your fitness regime. You can receive right. your dating app advice. So have you noticed um, also in your, in your readership and kind of engagement, let's say, with the New York Times audience, which is now so global, has that also changed? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, I think in the... The early years of the uh, the stone um i mean we had a really i mean what what neither of us had anticipated peter and i we hadn't anticipated was how um how much the the direction of the stone was guide was going to be guided by readers so we would uh, we got lots and lots of comments which were not abusive and nasty they were helpful and thoughtful and you discover that the United States is full of extremely well-educated, thoughtful people. And um, so we shaped it in relationship to the, uh, the feedback that we got. We took that very seriously. I used to read everything for a long time. If you, look, if you go from that to kind of where you are now, where in a sense, most of, many of the articles on Times don't allow responses because it's just going to be abusive. Um, and so, um, and the whole, uh, the, the mood has shifted. Um, I think the, the downside of it, the very clear downside of it for, for people like me and my editor is that we, we were trying to develop, um, develop writing and writers, right? So we didn't, we didn't begin this stone, this philosophy column idea that we, we get, as it were, the top philosophers in the world and then we would publish their, you know, their thoughts in, in the manner of, say, the Chronicle in the French newspapers, historically. Um, we found that uh, we discovered people. We, people emerged, talent emerged from um, all over the place. And we cultivated that, we worked with them, and we gave people the space to really kind of develop their voice. And that was great. So that was, you know, and that's what I really take away from it a close working relation, a close sense of what the readership uh, wanted and how, and a way of you know, being in touch with them. And then uh, an ability to develop writers and, and to develop writers who would say interesting things, but also weird things, you know, things that you're not gonna read elsewhere. So people didn't go to the stone to get more sort of, you know, basic, you know, New York Times op-ed stuff. They wanted something you know, a little bit weird. So we did, you know, three piece essays on, uh, three part essays on Philip K. Dick, things like that. I mean, you know, we, we, we really took great risks. It was great fun. And there's been, a, there's been definitely been a kind of a narrowing of focus, which is, which is also to do with the, uh, I think the fear that, you know, we live, we, we live with in the digital world of, of, of messing up, you know, of doing the wrong thing and then facing the consequences. So in a sense, the, um, the end of the stone or the, the, we're now the stone is kind of on hiatus, as they say here, um, which is also a story that's worth telling is that we, um, the times went through kind of uh, paroxysms in, the, uh, in 2020, um, which was, you know, people were in lockdown, all the meetings were on Zoom, all that stuff. And then there was this moment when there was a, an op-ed that was published by Senator Cotton during the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protests uh, in June 2020, which basically said something like, you know, send in, the, send in the troops or something like that. And this started a huge 
backlash at the New York Times and panic and whatever. And then they realized that they needed to control things more, right? Control things more, which is what they ended up doing. So uh, I think digitalization has, you know, is a, is a Janus faced phenomenon, actually. I think we, you know, it, it's, um, there's, there's an overwhelming fear that of corporations like the Times that just are saying the wrong thing. And, uh, and that actually limits what, what can be said. And, um, and so, and we've, um, and I mean, oddly, what happened with the stone was that um, the, the New York Times introduced a new, a new procedure was that they have opinion writers who are employed by the New York Times. You've got the gods like Krugman and Brooks and people and various other people. And then they have you now guest essays. Uh, and that was introduced, I think, at the end of 21. Um, and so they, so series, the idea of a series that would be organized between an editor and someone like me, I'm not, I've never been an employee of the New York Times. I used to receive $250 a month from the Times for my work on the stone, which I often didn't get, to be honest. So it wasn't exactly for the money. And the, um, it was, uh, but series did, just didn't, didn't fit in their new uh, conception of themselves, which was kind of worried about liability issues. So um, the, the stone was put on hiatus uh, and a series on disability was also put on hiatus. So, so that's, as it were, that was a consequence of the pandemic, uh, a whole series of things and then in a sense, the a, a, a media corporation like the Times trying to cover itself against messing up, you know. Well, so, as you say, I mean, as you as you say, there's this idea of messing up and, and control. And since I mean, maybe there wasn't place for series more broadly, but it sounds like there also it wasn't at all space for a series that was taking risks, like you were saying, like you want to do. And that's what struck me. Um, yeah. I want to talk about some of the specific um, mm -hmm. moments. In, in the book, um, some of the specific risks that you take by putting different points of view on very contentious issues in conversation. Before we do that, I, I do want to also highlight that um, Catapano points out in his introduction too, that again, thinking about, you know, with a concern, maybe a philosophical concern for your readership, that should um, a reader of Question Everything read the articles, the essays, or follow the questions in order that this order um, is a kind of philosophical journey. <laughs> so you mentioned some of some of the questions, but it, it there it starts. What does it mean to be human? Is democracy possible? Can we believe our eyes? Ending up with things like, do we need God? And now what? Um, can you tell us more about this journey and what would a nascent philosopher expect to discover about herself um, along the way, trailing it? Right. I mean. Um... <sighs> You know, expect that we, we hope that the you know reader would um I mean philosophy is a um philosophy is a journey into perplexity. That's really what it is. I mean, we um I mean philosophy in its recognizable form, although this is a debatable, it's a moot point, but let's say in its in its recognizable form begins in uh, classical Athens in the <clears throat> fifth century BC. And, um, and there's a lot to say about that. And um, Socrates raises questions, questions which have a universal form. What is justice? What is knowledge? What is perception? What is love? And he doesn't provide answers to these questions. Right? Other people give answers to these questions. They're called sophists. And philosophy is, posits itself against sophistry, which is basically uh, our version of sophistry would be I don't know, self-help movement or motivational speakers or gurus or people that will provide, you know, the reassuring balm of, a, of an answer. Philosophy is about opening questions, about a movement into perplexity, about the most basic questions uh, that concern human life and perhaps more than human life. And so we're trying to get people to follow that, that path. I mean, it's, you know... Um, I mean, one way of stating that philosophically is we're trying to cultivate, you know, aporia, perplexity, which is also linked to a kind of aporos, a path in, in, in ancient Greek. Um, 
if people think they have the answer, then, you know, then um, that's the danger. Socrates, you know, there are two things about Socrates that people know. He was A, the wisest man in Greece, and B, he didn't profess to know anything, right? So, and those two things, wisdom as a, as a wisdom as an ability to, to raise questions without knowing what the answers are, I think is, is in, a big, sort of incredible value. And if there's something that is, you know, wrong with the culture in general, it's the sense that people know what they think, right? They know what their, their views are, um, what justice is, what love yeah. is, what knowledge is. And um, so philosophy has resolved no major question in three millennia. And that's what makes it important. That's what makes, that's what keeps it relevant to keep reminding people of that, that the mm -hmm. basic questions which animate human beings are, are open questions which mm. invite everything to be uh, everything to be questioned so that's the journey we hope that people join us on to keep you know their minds open and uh, and and uh, and supple and to use these essays as kind of you know almost like you know exercise routines where you follow you know via uh, some very intelligent people grappling with big questions but in ways that I think another thing that we've insisted on in, in the stone and uh, I think been, been successful with is doing this in clear jargon free language so just doing it straightforwardly I mean it, you know I think I think everything everything that is important can be said clearly I think there's no excuse for academic jargon and it often just um, conceals uh, a kind of shallowness of thought the ability to use jargon so the uh, what we what we discovered with the stone was that there was a a huge public audience for philosophy in the United States and elsewhere, which is something which is more obvious somewhere like France, obviously, uh, where there's a tradition of you know, intellectuals engaging with the public realm, in the public realm. But in the United States, there's, a, there's this idea of um, the United States as an anti-intellectual culture and a non-philosophical culture and all of that. And we, yeah, in our humble way, we show that that was, that was a pretty silly view. People are, are animated by deep philosophical questions. They just need them to be presented in ways which are intelligible to them. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. Great, so I, I wanna talk about that particular point. I, I would like to go back to this idea of perplexing questions. What for you, there are 13, you have mm -hmm. several essays in the collection. Yeah. Which question for you is the one that haunts you as it were, or one or two? Right now? Sure. Um, gosh, um, you know, what does it mean to be human? It's a pretty good one. I mean, you know, and the sense in which we used to think that we had a way of answering that human beings are rational animals and so on and so forth. But the more that we know about the non human world, just think about the, you know, the emergence of literature on uh, on cephalopods, cephalopods in the last last few years, and the kind of explosion of interest in octopuses cuttlefish and squid and you know the idea that there are obviously non-human forms of intelligence uh, which took follow different evolutionary paths so the, the guy who woke up at 4am in australia i think is the guy you're talking about peter godfrey smith who wrote other minds i don't know oh, if you yeah. if you know his work but his work is... with great interest i uh, i think it's, it's a fantastic book and i oh, um there you go <laughs> That's, that's 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 terrific. I was thinking of I was thinking precisely of that book. It's um, yeah because it, it really opens that that perplexing question. You know, when we to the eyes <laughs> when you talk about the eye of the the octopus eye, what you're looking mm. into. It's it's hard to imagine this isn't a mind. This is mm. a mind in some mm. way, which is similar. So there's that. And I guess another question would be, oh, I don't know. Um, you know. Uh, you know, can, should speech be free? I think it's, mm. that's, that's another huge one. And it's, um, you know, we have to think about the relationship between you know, the emergence of platforms like this and issues mm. of freedom of speech. And, and I think it's, uh, they go back to Trump. Um, I think Trump raised a question about the, the possibility of satire, you know, when, mm. when, Trump himself was a kind of parody of himself, was a kind of, it was like performance art. So you, you know, it, it makes, um, it, it, the question changes. So I think that the, uh, 
the feeling that people have about the um, uh, the limitations on their freedom of speech, whether they're real or imagined. I think that's that's another that's another very real uh, real issue for me. Yeah, I, I liked there were two essays within the within the question of um, freedom of speech that struck me, and in part because they're right next to each other, and they. Um, they're not necessarily intention, but you might say that they're they're kind of expounding arguments that could be perceived as intention. So you have Agnes K. R. Um, yeah. asking, should we cancel Aristotle? And then ultimately yeah. saying, I would defend Aristotle and his place on a philosophy syllabus by pointing to the benefits of engaging with him. And then right afterwards, you have Ulrich Bayer mm -hmm. arguing for a, a kind of the freedom of speech um, or protection of speech of, of you know snowflakes so undergraduates at places like the new school um, right, right. I think that was brilliant I mean within the, within the question of freedom of speech to have two kind of opposing arguments can you talk about the importance of representing the, all of the different sides to these as you say unanswerable questions yeah yeah I mean precisely there we are there we, I mean there, there's a good you know we we that's not I mean the, the these uh, essays were published in a different sequence, but yes, they are meant to bounce off each other. And um, I think Agnes Callard's uh, question is, is, it's fascinating, you know, um, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, Aristotle hasn't been cancelled, but it's, uh, it, it, it does raise very interesting questions. And then, um, you know, it, it's also kind of um, too easy to uh, attack you know, uh, snowflakes, snowflake culture in um, certain prestigious corners of American academia, as uh, uh, without actually seeing what what's going on there and uh, whether um, whether that can be defended. So I think Willie Willie Bear makes a really really good point. So you know, we try to represent a variety of, of views. That's uh, and to put these pieces into argument argument with each other. That's the, that's the aim. Yeah, and then also, so you mentioned Kate Blanchett, and this yeah. is another point that you make. So not only are you asking academic philosophers to um, slough off their jargon, but you're also inviting people like Kate Blanchett, um, mm -hmm. Errol Morris, uh, Gary Gasparov to write um, for the collection. The idea being um, or the question, I guess, follows what happens to the discipline of philosophy when, when one opens the parameters of who is philosophizing and what have you learned from these non-traditional or n not kind of academically trained philosophers that you have not learned from your colleagues at the new school and elsewhere? Um, I guess, you know, to, again, to, 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 keep, to keep an open mind, the idea that one needs to be, I mean, it, the most obvious way of thinking about philosophy is, is a kind of a guild. It's like a medieval guild where you need a, you serve an apprenticeship, you have a master or a mistress, and then you're kind of, you're licensed by the institution to teach philosophy. And that's, you know, and that takes place in this thing called the university, which goes back to obviously 12th century Paris and, and beyond. But the, the um, and there's, you know, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but the idea that we have the, uh, you know, we have the we have to say we're the kind of police force in terms of who gets to speak as a philosopher or not. I think is ridiculous, and I think the um, what we try to do in the stone is to open things up. So um, if that means that Kate Blanchet has got something to say, or or uh, Errol Morris, who's an incredibly thoughtful uh, documentary maker, and uh, or Sonny Rollins, then we will include that. And it, it just, I think it just, it just opens things up and gives a sense that you can put papers by, you know, you know, Errol Morris alongside, you know, a mainstream philosopher um, or a, a, someone who's an academic philosopher. And also something we tried to do in very consciously in the, in the stone over the years is to, um, is to really uh, push questions of, um, you know, who gets to speak as a philosopher. Uh, we have had a, 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 a significant number of a whole, whole series on questions of, of race. This was back in 2015, 16, 17, with someone called George Yancey, and also trying to, you know, increase the uh, 
the uh, the gender representation in philosophy, which which is which is something it, which can be hard work because if you haven't run a column like this, you get lots of submissions, but they're mainly from chaps, you know, uh, a lot of submissions on John Rawls, whatever it might be, and to cultivate uh, women philosophers, it required a lot of um, cultivation on my part and the part of Peter and. Uh, and then, you know, when that work begins to be published, you begin to get an audience for it, then uh, submissions, the nature of the submissions begins to change, but you can't just, you know, a lot of this, it might look as if, you know, we just, this is stuff that just rolled in and we edited, edited it, but we, we really kind of curated uh, material really, really carefully. Otherwise it would have looked a very different, a very different book and a very different series. So yeah. Um, I want to, yeah, I want to ask you about this idea of cultivation. It's a lovely, it's a lovely one because you also referenced it at the beginning of the conversation, saying that you, you know, what was important to you is to find these emerging voices and work with them. Yes. yes. Um, you also mentioned Justin E. H. Smith, who actually spoke at the library a couple of weeks ago. Who are some of who, who are um. Who are some of these people that you felt that you really gave a platform to, and what does that process of cultivation look like you know what do they expect to uh, if you could just give us an insight into a lot, a lot of how you think of cultivation which is obviously a philosoph philosophically charged term in itself yeah yeah i mean you know so i don't know for example um i remember i wanted i wanted us to publish something on the trayvon martin killing and i wanted something on that and it really it took a, a while to find um uh, a philosopher that would take it on. We found George Yancey, and then we'd work with George, uh, and this would be, you know, looking at drafts, developing drafts over long periods of time. And then, you know, he, you, he begins to get a sense of the audience and then and then, then you're off to the races. But it really requires lots of, lots of looking at drafts, lots of, um, lots and lots of back and forth. It was, a, you know, a huge amount of work but good work because these are often people that i i barely know you know it's not as if i'm we're publishing work by by friends or anything like that we're publishing work by people that just kind of uh showed up in the in the inbox and then you would work with them on a series of series of drafts until you you get them to actually write in a way i mean what what you want an op-ed do is to do is to, is to pop right is to be something you want to you want to read you want to you want to, um, you're intrigued by it. So the, the opening paragraph is very important and getting people to really drop their academic wigs and gowns and, uh, and crowns and to actually just speak directly to an audience on a, on a topic of, uh, of, of great importance. Okay, this is a really interesting point and I have two questions to ask you about it. One is, do you think that it's also changed your relationship to your own writing? Oh yeah, yeah. Being edited, I mean, you know, by I mean Peter Catapano and the other editors at the Times, you you get away with nothing, and so it really is, uh, you know, it, it means that your vanity and narcissism really takes a takes a blow, and a, a lot of you know, there's a lot, an awful lot of things that I did that were not published, and other people did, and you just have to just take it on the shin. This is something that just doesn't work, and so accepting the you know, submitting to editors is a, is is a really important part of this process, and a lot of philosophers, a lot of academics are just, are just not used to being edited at all. And it's uh, editors exist for a reason, you know. So that's 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 important. And then just thinking this, thinking about this idea of of the pop, as you say, how do you toe the line between an engaging opening paragraph and the things going viral on the internet? I mean. You know, because the the kind of sensationism and th th yeah, things going viral on mostly on Twitter. Um, surely you don't. That's not what you mean by pop. No, Maybe not at all. No. Now we 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 had a. I mean, what I learned, what I really learned from Peter, because we got we were attacked a lot, uh, particularly in the early years by um, different people, but mainly from representatives of the philosophical establishment. Let's say. Um, because, you know, and I was, 
I got a lot of lot of heat from that. And um, so uh, we, the way me and Peter worked was that we 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 cultivate the writing of the things that came in and we could work with and we read submissions and we just kept our heads down and moved and we didn't really look uh we kept blinkers on kept moving and didn't really look uh left or right so the the issue of whether whether things were viral or not we didn't really we weren't really concerned about that at all some pieces really really blew up and a lot of pieces didn't and we didn't really care we just tried to publish what we thought was good and worthy of being published and I so I think, I think a lot of it's to do with it having the courage to ignore the reaction of of, uh, of the of the apparent audience and just to you know, defiantly plow on, yeah. which is what we did. Yeah, yeah. There's a lovely image. I'm I'm trying to remember from which text it comes from. I think it's from some. It's it's from somewhere in the Mahabharata, but it's this idea of an elephant moving through a village and all the dogs barking at the elephant, and. Mm -hmm this kind of idea of elephant, elephantine um, intelligence on the move and that the dogs will always bark in the village and the elephant needs to keep moving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we were an elephant and we, we <laughs> kept moving. And we, were, we had a sense of, you know, what we were doing and what you the- had a sense of elephantine purpose. <laughs> and what, what, the, what the bar was, you know, how if we wanted work of a certain quality and we yeah. tried to make it better and it meant, you know, it meant being, this isn't this isn't a way of making friends running a column because basically you're going to piss a lot of people off because you can't publish their work. So it's mm. a it's uh, it's it, you know it, it for someone like me it's, it's it's been a really you know I've learned learned a, a lot from this in terms of if you if you um, want to produce work of a consistently uh, high quality what you've got to do to make that happen and it means. Um, yeah, you take some heat, but basically you've got to ignore things, right? Yeah. Just just keeping things out and, and moving on um, with a clarity of purpose. A great a great lesson for anyone, for everyone on the call. I also want to ask about, you know, the, the kind of elephant, well, to keep going with this idea, in the room okay. is, is Peter, who we keep mentioning, uh, who's not here, who's obviously American. I mean, so I was looking up how to say his his last name and to say it in an American accent renders it in a totally different way. And so I just thought I, I can't do that. So I'll say it um, as we've been saying it, but he, and your English, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Catapano. Um, yeah. He's so yeah, he's, he's from South Island. You're not. Uh, no. Do you think that your Anglo-American you know, you're the Anglo-American dual vision of philosophy. What do you think, how does that contribute to your editing process? And, you know, you've also been saying kind of in the call that you've been surprised by the Americans and it, it, there is a sense, maybe, do you still feel like an onlooker on American society or do you feel integrated into, into America? In, in New York, for sure. Yeah, it's, you know. For sure, it's a, and the very American phrase. Yeah, right. But I find it's, um, I think Peter and I have both got chips on our shoulders <laughs> about different things. With me, it's, um, it's definitely, you know, class, social class, and the way that is refracted in a discipline like philosophy in, mm. in somewhere like Great Britain, and as I've experienced that. So I found, I found being in the US um, mm. enabling, you know, has been liberating. And Peter, I think, is someone who, you know, he started off in the, you know, kind of making making cups of tea and as a delivery boy with the Times a long time ago. And mm. he's been there. And there's a kind of, like, we share a kind of um, defiance and a, and a, a, a distrust of um, established hierarchies, let's just say. So it's, uh, um, so I think it's been a, you know, we um, we we've we functioned as, as a unit. We tried to expand it over the years, not with any consistent success. Basically, we just we've just worked together. You know, having someone you really trust and uh, is, is really important. So uh, we've uh, we've worked together for all of these years, and it's been great. And I've learned, you know. So I think also having someone that uh, for me is you know someone that writes and thinks. I mean, you get used to 
know, you get used to, your teaching allows you to get away with things in terms of, you can say all sorts of things in class and uh, they can sound, you know, deep and profound and whatever. But if you're writing for a newspaper, it has to work in a newspaper. So accepting that, you know, whatever brilliant your thoughts, you may think your thoughts are, they have to kind of, they have to work on the page in a way that everybody can understand. And that means, as I said before, submitting to the editorial process, letting your, you know, letting the beautiful flowers sometimes go in order to really make a point. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's painful, but really important. It's made me a better writer, I think. I, I want to echo your point about Brits abroad. I mean, in the sense that I, I also, ha I had the experience having grown up in the UK and then being, doing my education in America, that it, it's quite liberating actually, you know, if you, if you're coming from class-based, I would argue more sexist society, um, mm. there's a kind of breath of fresh air um, in the New York streets. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I found I, it's, it's uh, absolutely, uh, it's been, um, and also because you, you know, um, it's, it's harder to be read. People find it hard to, to read me, harder to read me here, and they don't care. Mm. You know, I never get asked where I'm from. Nobody really, mm. nobody cares. I'm from somewhere else. Everybody's from somewhere else here. So that's, uh, that's fine. But the, and then the question is, well, are you any good? You know, have you have you got stuff to say? Are you can you can you cut the mustard? That's what that's what matters, and I'm I'm, ha I'm much happier with that than certainly what I was experiencing in Britain. In my I left about eighteen years ago, and certainly I would you know I, I had a, a fine time in uh, teaching in in universities in in, uh, in Britain, but um, it's uh, it's been a lot more a lot more fun here, and mm. there's a which and also trying to prove the point for me i mean philosophy is part of the life of culture it has to be part of the life of culture and that's something which when i was educated in france part of the time a long a long time ago and that was something that i always admired about mm -hmm. french um french philosophical life its mm -hmm. ability to engage with issues of common cultural significance and uh, I think what we've proved with the stone is that's as true of the United States as it is of someone like France. Mm. I want to go, this, this actually leads nicely, I want to go specifically to um, some of your essays in the collection because you oh, yourself right. write. So you're giving the platform to other people, but you know, you're also intervening in the questions. Um, I really enjoyed um, the essay, The Tragedy of Democracy, in part for its, in, its enticing title that then totally upends your expectation um, because you're yeah. talking about ancient Athenian tragedy as opposed to what we think of tragedy in the 21st century with populism very much on the rise. Can you just tell us briefly about the argument um, in this essay in which you look to Athenian democracy and ancient tragedy from almost three millennia ago and talk about theatre as this kind of political mechanism. Yeah, I mean, it's um, uh, one thing I did, um, I wrote a series of essays, eight essays from Athens in, yeah. <laughs> in 2019, which was, um, which was, you know, it's kind of getting away with it. It was kind of, you know, and, and, and this wasn't really an idea. It was like Peter and I, I was going to Athens and then we performed an idea and then it became, um, I, I then began to, each, each essay would be about a thing or a place. Mm. So there was an essay about um, the site of Plato's Academy, Aristotle's Lyceum, and this one, Tragedy of Democracy, is about the monument of Lysicrates, which is um, in, the, in the placa in the old, old city of Athens, and it's the only remaining tripod right, uh, in the streets of Athens, and tripods were given as prizes to the, uh, the tragedy that won the, the contest in the, uh, the, 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 the festival of Dionysius that took place in sailing season at the, in the end of March, beginning of April each year. And what we try and, what I try and do in this, this essay is to look at the relationship between uh, democracy as a, as a political form and, and tragedy and drama and to show how those two things uh, feed off each other and, um, and, you know, and what's going on in, 
what's going on in in tragedy uh, is kind of not what you, what people normally think. It's I try the story I try and tell in this piece, as I recall, is how what's going on in tragedy is uh, issues around uh, ethnic identity, uh, migration, um, huge theme in the in, in the plays. Who is Greek? Who is not Greek? Who can be admitted into the city? And this, of course, in the context of Athens, which was um, where questions of immigration have been hugely important in the last 10 years in particular. Mm -hmm. Questions of refuge, asylum seeking, immigration, mm -hmm. sexual violence, duties of hospitality, so on and so forth. So I try and show that uh, theatre is a kind of political mechanism uh, that that reflects democracy to itself. That um, it's, uh, I could put that probably better. The, um, I think I say something like there is, um, there's, 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 a, there's a polyphony to antiquity. You know, it's not one voice, there are many voices. So we have the, the institutions of democracy, um, uh, the Penix and the council and so on and so forth. And then we have what appears to be the opposite going on in drama, but actually the, there's a complementarity between the between drama and democracy. And all of it, of course, staged to enormous audiences who would watch these plays all day long. Yeah, yeah, and then and then philosophy, philosophy emerges as a reaction against theatre and a reaction against and a reaction against democracy. Because one thing that, or two things that are absolutely clear. In, in Plato is that, you know, democracy is terrible and, uh, and poets are not to be trusted. So- Poets are banished from the Callipolis. Poets are banished from the Callipolis and, uh, and the only, the best form of government would be government by philosophers, of course, <laughs> experts, people trained. And we have to keep theatre out and control what counts as as art? So, it's um, you know, and then the question is, well, how how serious actually are Plato's arguments? Because they're mm -hmm. also staged dramatically and spoken indirectly, and nowhere mm -hmm. in any place do we have an idea of what Plato's opinion about anything was. <laughs> nor, nor is it clear if you you know what he wrote, if he wrote anything. Um, mm -hmm. So, so. Um, and then at the core of that was kind of you know, trying to think about um, try, those essays from Athens were ways of trying to produce a different image of, of, of antiquity and a different image of, of the present. So we mm. had this very, very kind of pristine idea of classical Greece, mm. which simply doesn't match up to uh, the reality of contemporary Greece and the way contemporary Greece negotiates its relationship to the past. So the essays were kind of ways of giving a different voice to that. Mm. Um, and yeah. lovely. And we, ha we do have a question from Michael Bartley and I'm encouraging everyone also to post their questions and comments if oh, you I haven't. Do. But I, I wanna ask you about your final essay. Uh, oh, yeah. I think it was the final one in the collection um, in part because it's, I first actually read you in a class on Beckett and I wrote my, my, my mm -hmm. thesis on Beckett and I'm also a huge fan of David Bowie so it's rare to find somebody who <laughs> shares idols. I mean really I think the combination of Samuel Beckett and David Bowie is a, is a lovely combination so I'm just excited that there's someone else who has this um, these two figures very much present in their mind but can you tell us about um, your essay What Would David Bowie do and I think it's such a talk about um, you know an, an engaging opening, basically saying that since David Bowie's died, the world has gone to hell. <laughs> right, yeah, that's basically the argument. Is that five, this was this was written? It was published it was five years after yes. Bowie's death, and basically the world has gone to pieces since David Bowie died. Brexit, you know, Trump, and uh, I try and um, you know, uh, I mean, for me, Bowie is. You know, hugely, hugely, hugely important. But uh, gosh, I mean, the personal dimension to this was that uh, when Bo Bowie died, uh, my mother died a, a month before Bowie died, and um, I found it very. I was very close to my mother. It was very hard to find any words, and then um, and then Bowie died, and suddenly there were lots of words. So uh, Bowie Bowie's death gave me a way of uh, articulating my my grief. 
and uh, I was talking to, about Bowie with all sorts of people. And New York, after Bowie's death, was was fantastic. You know, there was there was music bars open, uh, Bowie's music being played, and you got the sense not the sense the the the, the real uh, the reality that uh, his work means so much to so many people of different generations. And this this is really important for me. I mean, I I love pop music. And um, there's a tendency of people of say my vintage to say, well, of course, you know, if you've been there in, in this club in the late seventies, then you'd really understand what this is about. And that's nonsense. I mean, the question is, is how does, how does pop music, can pop music survive kind of as, as art? Is it, is it, is it inheritable, transmissible? And I think Bowie is a fantastic example of someone, if you were there in the early seventies, then great, but, uh, it doesn't really matter whether you were there in Prague with Kafka or not. We don't think that's the kind of, you know, that kind of gives you ultimate legitimacy to pass judgment on how good Kafka is. And I think similarly with someone like Bowie is that Bowie is now passed into a different, um, a different period of reception and his work will be listened to for generations to come. And that makes me incredibly happy. Uh, and so, um, I look at some. I look at the, the the dystopia in Bowie and the uh, the sense of the fraudulence of the world, uh, the picture of the world that you get in particular in on albums like Diamond Dogs, and trying to show that that um, that dystopia in Bowie is actually a kind of affirmation, a kind of courage, a kind of um, you know, in the words of rock and roll suicide, you're not alone, you're wonderful. So there's something about Bowie, which is not unlike Beckett, right? I think Beckett for me, you, you know, we, you can think of Beckett as rather glum. Uh, I find Beckett hysterically funny, you know, all about laughing funny. And uh, I'm amazed that people take him as seriously as they take him in the sense in which, you know, this is ponderous and slow. No, it's, it, it's, it's not about fun as well as being about all the important things so they are kind of you know cosmic twins in some way although i'm sure beckett would have loathed bowie. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure that bowie... i have not really put them in conversation in my head they, yeah. they exist in such separate times you know because i i mean my my encounter with bowie was for whatever reason one of my parents friends gave me a, a cd of Hunky Dory when I was kind of like 12. And so I used to listen to it every night before I went to bed. All right. that's, that's how I got to know Bowie and then Beckett. I suppose my 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 love for Beckett came later. So um, I haven't ever put them in conversation, but I would be curious to see um, what they would be like together in, in person. So funny. And I'm sure Bowie pretended to read Beckett at certain points in his career. Yeah. But but yeah, the um, I think there's also there's a there's a deep sense of the um, I mean thinking you know semi seriously about that that the, the um, one of the books which Bowie loved and which was really important to him and important to me too mm. is the Divided Self by yeah. R.D. Lang and there's a sense in which you know that book where you know um, Lang is trying to mm. Develop an argument for what he calls the normal schizoid self. Mm. I think is really what Bowie's up to, and I say, and the sense what what Beckett's up to mm. in pieces with the trilogy through to to not I, and entering um, mm. the division of the self. I think is central in Beckett as a as a tragic fact, but also as a a comic one as well. No, this is so interesting. You know, because I've been um, actually re reworking my my uh, my essay for this writing sample that I'm submitting and I've been so I've been returning to these quotes from from the unnameable you know and he's saying no nominative no accusative there's no I where there's any so like uh, the French philosopher Blanchot said where there's any where there was narrative there's now conflict there's the entire um yeah. you know breakdown of any stability Okay, we can talk about Beckett for a very long time. I want to get to this question. So Michael asks, you mentioned, he, he wrote this um, in the chat, you mentioned the New York Times incident with Senator Cotton's controversial op-ed. I think 
um, one of the man managing editors was forced to resign after many New York Times staff yeah. believe the article should not have been published. I'm not interested, he says, in particularly relitigating whether or not that op-ed should have been published, but I am interested in whether that incident has placed any pressure on you to avoid publishing articles that could be considered provocative and possibly offensive to some readers. Was, in other words, was there a kind of shift? Was that a, was that a, a turning yeah, point? It's a very, very good question. It's a very good question, actually, because it's, uh, I mean, I could say no. I mean, there wasn't a shift, but on the other hand, yes, that you, you're aware of, you know, the weather changing, of uh, the clouds gathering and, um, you know, what the temperature is like outside when you stick your nose out of the door. So in a sense, most of the time we were able to ignore mm. uh, the larger context for as long as it allowed us to do our work. Mm. But I mean, the effect of that, that, in, that incident at the, the end of times and the um, uh, firing and moving of people and, you mm. know, has basically led to the... Uh, the stone being put on hiatus because it it didn't fit because they couldn't really series were things that they couldn't really control and they want in the way they want to control and mm -hmm. um, so that's that, that's a bit sad mm -hmm. and at certain points I mean I mean I uh, I mean I, I'm very you know I I was at different points in the over the years there were you get, you know, noises from, um, you know, uh, central command, as it were, that, you know, whether they wanted more of this or less of that, which again, we could mostly ignore. But I remember one moment in particular when there was a kind of, there was a wish expressed to have more conservative uh, voices in um, places like the Stone. And I was, I was very happy with that. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very interested in, in say classical conservatism. Uh, so we did publish a couple of pieces by Rod Roger Scruton, I remember, which were very, very funny and, uh, uh, and brilliant. But it was actually very hard to find conservative voices and, and to give them, give them uh, and that's changed. I mean, I think the, I think what for, for, for good or ill, and I think largely for ill um, and, and quite why this has happened, and you know, is 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 unclear to me. But you know, for example, I, I was at the University of Essex um, for many years. I I was a student there, and I ended up teaching there. And Essex was known as a kind of left wing campus university. But there were tons of very conservative teachers and students. Um, the conservative students were incredibly active, and there were huge fights. Right, and. Uh, huge fights in meetings and all of that. And that was fine, right? Uh, whereas now there's, there's been a, there's, there's very clearly been a, um, a narrowing of what can be said in terms of, in, certainly in places like the New York Times, a narrowing of what is acceptable public discourse. And I think that is, that, that is a problem. Uh, but do you think, but so this is an interesting question because I think my generation feels that and feels frankly that the New York Times is basically, I mean, uh, to take the pulse of the cultural moment, I don't look to the New York Times. I don't really, I don't really read the New York Times anymore, no. precisely for this point, because mm -hmm. I think there has been a narrowing, but I don't think that that tracks onto a lack of interest in, in, in wanting to be provoked and wanting to have our ideas challenged, I, I, I mean that's that's my own belief. I mean, do you do you feel that? Who, who where do you look to? Where do you go to get kind of apart from apart from? I wish I had the the physical copy. I've been reading this on PDF, but let's pretend this is question everything. <laughs> apart from question everything, um, where else do you go to get your ideas beaten up? Or your ideas challenged, and actually, this will be my final question. Sorry, okay. sorry the time. Which which essay in question everything really? I asked you which which um question kind of you know disrupted you, but which essay maybe really challenged you the most in this new collection? Um, okay, I mean, which there's... you know this is the this is the desert island disc. Which one do you save from the the waves? <laughs> I, I would say, I mean, apart from your own. Strange, strange choice, but the there's there's a, I think a fantastic essay by 
someone called Galen Strawson. And Galen Strawson, um, very, very good philosopher. And uh, it's, and the essay is called Consciousness Isn't a Mystery, It's Matter. And, and this, this essay just, there's all of this talk of consciousness and consciousness being, you know, how do we explain it? Isn't it a mystery? You know, how do we, you know, how do we, and it's, it's, there's nothing, there's nothing mysterious about consciousness. It's just human awareness. What is mysterious is matter. And, um, and that leads him into a series of inquiries into uh, the explanations that physics give, uh, physics gives of, of, of the nature of, of matter. And that's a fantastic piece because it just inverts the way things are normally viewed. It's not mind that's complicated, it's matter that's complicated. And he also begins to attack uh, physics, which is kind of really a sacred cow. That you know, physics does this extraordinary job of giving us the whole network of equations uh, to uh, to give us a picture of the universe, but doesn't give us a sense of what it is to be in the cosmos, right? To have an understanding of the cosmos, to live in the cosmos, and therefore physics kind of also fails. And we need a richer philosophical discussion. So that's a good one. I recommend that. And uh, where do I get? I think I think the I think your view of the Times is uh, yeah you know, you're not alone. I think and I don't think the Times is is speaking to the audience that it used to speak to. And I think there's been a narrowing of horizons. And I think people get their information from different different sources. Um, where do you get your? You um, get? Well, you know, I would say f French. French and European outlets. Yeah. I'm much more interested, frankly, by the, I listen to the radio, so I'm much more interested by the conversations that are happening on the French radio than I am um, about, mm. than I am looking at the New York Times website. In part because, well, we're, now we're, we're, this will really be the last kind of think point I'll make, but the, 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 there was a point that was made in this essay about the difference between drawing, basically responding from your experience versus responding from argument. And so much of American discourse is responding from, based on my experience, this is, you know, and, and that hasn't really, that just doesn't really happen so much in France. And it mean, it just, the level, I'd say the level of discourse as a result is, is slightly more elevated. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that I think it's the it's the uh you know the kind of terrifying slightly terrifying effects of the um you know the politics of identity in places like the US that mm -hmm. in a sense that the you know people feel entitled to speak from their experience mm -hmm. in terms of you know I am this that and the other and you list mm -hmm. your identity predicates um some idea of you know linked to some idea of victimization and grievance and then um and this gives 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 one an air of authenticity and i think that is uh, that's a very dangerous thing mm. i think you know in a sense that philosophy is about can also be about experiences but it's uh, it's mainly about about arguments of course of the mm. best arguments so i think it's um and i think the um i'd be very curious to see you know um I mean, what effects that has had, say, in the French context in the last 10 years. I know it's a controversial issue. Le wokeism, right? 